Hello, everybody. Um, thank you all so much for joining me this afternoon on our uh, presentation. Really quick, just before we get going, if, if you guys, um, for those of you that are in front of your computer that have the ability to type in the chat box, if you just don't mind chatting in that you can hear me loud and clear, that would be helpful just so I know that uh, audio is working okay and we're, we're good to get started. So I'll just wait until we at least have one or two folks um, reply back and um, that'll give me the green light. Awesome. Thanks, guys. I'm seeing some some answers come in. So again, um, thank you all so much uh, for taking the time to join me this afternoon. I am going to cover our How to Buy Investment Property presentation. Um, this is a staple event within our company. Uh, I am going to explain our methodology and process. <clears throat> we guide, guide clients through uh, when acquiring investment property. And, you know, for some folks, this may seem like a, a daunting task. Um, for those of you that may be new to the idea, but I'm here to explain how we at Marshall Reddick can make this happen for you as we have for, you know, as we've had for thousands of other clients. So I um, want to do a quick intro, let you guys know who I am. So my name is Vince Tomich. I'm an advisor here at Marshall Reddick. And my primary role as an advisor is to learn as much as I can about each individual and help guide you through your investment you know, your investment process and achieve your goals. A um, little bit more about myself personally. I was born and raised <clears throat> here in Southern California. I have been in the real estate industry now for over eight years. And, you know, prior to my role as an advisor, I was a mortgage lender for a number of years. And that's where I learned the value of, of leveraging money. And um, I, I had a few investment properties <clears throat> and, that I that I got into and it just it it you know made me become more and more interested in that world and, and learning as much as I can about it and you know when I was when I discovered Marshall Reddick uh, through an event like you guys are on tonight and when I did discover Marshall Reddick and I found a company that essentially is a one-stop shop to help facilitate the acquisition management in uh, you know just supervision of this process it, you know I w I was all ears as I just found that to be a, a really great path as an investor. But then for me uh, personally, as to want to take it a step further and actually work for the company and get involved. So, you know, I do practice what I preach. I have purchased properties through Marshall Reddick. I have uh, Marshall Reddick managing property. I have borrowed money with Marshall Reddick. I have lent money with Marshall Reddick. I have definitely done my fair share of personal transactions with Marshall Reddick and you know, again, I, I I think that really helps when having conversations with with you folks, right? When trying to figure out what it is you're trying to achieve in your goals, and being able to relate some of those stories and situations into personal uh, personal things, and uh, I, I just think it, it it helps the flow and and definitely helps uh, explain things a bit better when using real life examples. So. Yeah, for, for those of you that may be new, though, to Marshall Reddick, this is always a good time for me to explain, you know, who we are and, and what we do as a company. So um, Marshall Reddick is a full, I would consider, you know, real estate firm. And we basically have four services that we focus on. So we have our real estate brokerage, our property management, our private lending, and our mortgage fund. So a little bit more uh, to dive into those specifically. So our real estate brokerage, we help people buy and sell real estate, whether it's a primary residence or whether it's an investment property. We can help with either or. Um, for property management, so 99% of the folks that end up buying an investment property, they are going to need to leverage property management in some capacity. So we help them from A to Z. So we do everything from marketing the properties to rent collection, rent disbursement. We fix you know, any kind of maintenance issues. Uh, we also prepare tax documents at the end of the year to, to issue to your CPA. Um, you know, move-ins, move-outs, anything associated with operating the property. Uh, our next service is private lending. So there's basically, you know, two types of clients there and i'll break that down further but um <clears throat> primarily you know from the lending side from the or should i say from the borrowing side um 
this is very different than your conventional loan that you know most of us would use to either buy your primary or or an investment property these are you know what's called private or or hard money lending and typically our borrowers are going to be um maybe the short-term folks are going to be fix and flippers right people who are looking to buy a property rehab it and then either sell it or, or refinance out of that loan uh, maybe a, like a bridge loan so maybe for whatever reason you conventional financing uh is not available to you at this very moment and you need some kind of short-term financing to get you to to that point that would be another example of people that borrow from us from a short-term standpoint from a long-term standpoint we do have some other options um maybe you have more than 10 financed properties you can't get a conventional loan maybe you have a self-directed retirement account and you want to buy a property within that entity and you would need what's called a non-recourse loan we would offer our private lending offers a solution to that so that would be another example of someone who would borrow from a long-term standpoint now on the flip side to borrowing money <clears throat> let's say that you weren't someone who needed to borrow money but you still you know and and for whatever reason you know investing in real estate wasn't right for you at this time another awesome you know alternative that we offer is the ability to lend money so you know the loans that i was just describing we offer our investors the opportunity to lend their capital right so you can be the bank you can be in a first position lien and collect interest payments or mortgage payments rather than collecting you know rent checks right so there's two ways that we offer that service. It's in the direct capacity. And what I mean by that is you are one lender and you would fund one project. So that's you know a one-to-one -one kind of ratio. Uh, the other option is our last service here, was, which is an investment fund. So we have a pooled group of investors, right? Uh, where we have a mortgage fund. That mortgage fund is you know just north of 45 million at this time. And we take that money and we lend <clears throat> to multiple different projects, multiple different people across the country. So that, that money is spread amongst various loans to kind of diversify that risk. Um, and that's a really great way for a lot of our investors to get involved, especially from the lending standpoint. Um, you know, it's a smaller point of entry, it's more diversification, and you get quarterly distributions, and that money can work in perpetuity as long as you want. So that's a really great alternative for some of the folks that you know may not leverage our brokerage property management or, or, or our borrowing. So you can always lend as well. So those are a little bit more about our services. And you know, my role as an advisor is to ultimately guide you and help educate you on all of those services and get you connected with the right folks or help you personally um, to exercise any of those services that you may wanna explore more. So the topics that we're going to be covering this afternoon, um, how to set your investment criteria, <clears throat> how to conduct proper due diligence. We're going to do, uh, we're going to look at some formulas and some calculations. Uh, I have some, some properties that I picked that we can look at. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about financing very briefly and some options. I, I know that, you know, financing may be a kind of a hot topic. At this point, um, I'll go over kind of high level, but you know, for the actual specific rates and terms, we we have a awesome preferred lender that I'm happy to connect you with to go over the specifics of each person's situation. Um, we just kind of explained a little bit more about property management, but I'll dive into that a little bit deeper, and then we'll we'll go over some locations, you know, so places that we operate in and that we have a full service. Um, system that can help you guys buy investment property so where do you begin right where does it start and it, and it does start with talking to an advisor like myself <clears throat> this is where i have a chance to connect uh to learn a little bit more about you to understand what you're looking for and how we can help you get there right uh different people are going to have different expectations and different you know uh, goals and that's that's the job is to figure that those out and then advise and and offer solutions that are within our um, within our company and within our services so the phone calls start with me and you know what that phone call is going to look like is um, basically it's going to we're going to go over the who what when where and why right so 
why do you feel like or why do you want to buy investment property right why real estate there's plenty of other opportunities right you can buy stocks bonds mutual funds all kinds of different things and i think one of the answers right now would be you know buying hard assets and buying something that's tangible and that you know provides value like uh shelter is a is a good is a good place to park your money right um i know some of there's other specific uh areas within real estate <clears throat> that may not be as successful right i know there's uh some commercial you know turbulence out there but ultimately you know the what what we focus on is kind of that uh one to four unit range it, we will get into some larger multifamily, but it's all about investment property where people are going to live that's something that we feel as though is not going anywhere right People aren't living in bubbles any uh, at any time soon. They, there's people need to live indoors, and that's something that we feel is like a safe in, investment that is going to be around for a very long time. Um, how to buy, right? So there's multiple options. Some of you may be familiar uh, with with all of those options. Some of you may not. We'll, we'll kind of cover that. Um, when is it something that you want to do right away? Is it something that you want to do next year? Um, in the next three years? Uh, wh whatever time frame that is, we can go over that. And what type of property is going to be another important one? So, uh, as I mentioned, there's you know single-family homes, there's two units, there's four units, there's ten units. It's it's kind of dependent on again you know a lot of factors, but um, what what kind is going to be an important conversation for us? And then where ultimately identifying those markets. Um, you know, not all markets across the country make sense. So it's good to kind of understand what you may be getting yourself into or what to expect when you do get into a certain market. Um, and then last but definitely not least is the who, right? There's there's so many more people than myself involved in this. And that's one of the big allures to Marshall Reddick is that ultimately we have such a great team and so many resources, and so many people that can help that um, we are able to take on, uh, you know, we do have quite a bit of bandwidth, right? From managing in multiple markets to agents in multiple markets and coordinating things all all throughout together. So uh, there's a lot of individuals from like advisors, like I said, property managers, agents, uh, our accounting team, everybody involved. So there's a lot of folks that um, that are part of this process. So, the first section that we want to cover here is what, right? So a l getting a better understanding of your personal investment criteria. Um, so, you know, all of these factors that you see here are important to understand when figuring out, uh, you know, what you're going to be buying. Although, like I said earlier, uh, not everyone is going to have the same goal. You know, people qualify for different amounts. People are looking for different results. And as a team, we would come up with the best approach for, for what you are trying to accomplish. So, you know, for those of you that are just trying to get your foot in the door, you may be looking for a, a lower purchase price. Or for, for some of you that, um, let's say, are, you know, have some, definitely have a good amount of capital to work with, but you're going to be working for a long time and not as concerned about cash flow, you're going to really want a, a solid property that's going to appreciate, you know, for years and years and years, right? And um, we'll talk a little bit more about property classes later. Um, but then there might be some of you that want to bump up that cash flow, and you need you need more now. Uh, maybe that's going to mean that you have to go up in in number of doors. So, like I said, duplex, triplex, four units, right? Um, condition wise, right? So we can go anywhere from a brand new construction, which we sell a ton of. Uh, I have one of those in as an example to to cover tonight, and then all the way to Places that definitely could be more of a what we'd consider a fixer. Um, we do have those opportunities for you as well. Again, that's going to be based a lot of, of experience, right? Is that something that you're capable or comfortable dealing with? Just because there are going to be some limitations, especially if you're not in that market in terms of um, having that venture be successful. So we can go into more detail as well. And um, yeah, again, you know, property details. Uh, are, are going to be part of that equation as well. So setting your investment criteria. 
So different, um, what you're gonna notice just right off the bat, if, for those of you that have not been to our website, I highly recommend taking a peek and looking at properties. And this will give you a good understanding of you know, the effort and time that we've put in to come up with these pro formas and these calculations and forecast how a property is gonna perform. But one thing you're gonna notice on every single one of our properties is there gonna be a property class there, right? So that property class, you'll see that a kind of scale below it starts from luxury and it goes all the way to d class um basically you know we focus on i would say a to c you you will see some luxury properties as well but a lot of times it's going to be a to c class properties um primarily a and b is what you're going to see the most of um but basically you know different property classes are going to provide different results so, you know, as you can see on the screen here, the higher the property class tends to come with the most appreciation. And then as the property class gets lower, you're going to see that that cash flow increases. And it's kind of a sliding scale, right? Uh, I, I'm a big believer in kind of a blend, right? You, it's nice to have a little bit of both, but it, that's in, in essence kind of how this works. You're either going to kind of lean towards the appreciation side of, of, a, of an investment or lean towards a cash flow perspective. And let me give you some really good examples. So here in Southern California, or just in California in general, it's very, very difficult to generate cash flow, right? Just because of where the purchase prices are and where the rents are. That price to rent <coughs> ratio is <coughs> much bigger. So, um, <coughs> It's that's what makes it very difficult to cash flow. <clears throat> but on the flip side, you know, year over year, California has proven to be a market of great appreciation. <clears throat> and that's definitely a huge part of, of investing and in where you can make quite a bit of <clears throat> return. Um, and it's not from your monthly income. It's definitely from a long term, long term hold. And then on the flip side of that, you may have some of you, some of the, your other markets across the country um, where the price points are are much much lower, and therefore that rent can then take you know cover the mortgage, cover the taxes, cover the insurance, and then you have a cash flow element. You have money left over, and then that's another kind of um, avenue that people go after. But oftentimes, the more cash flow you get. In, in a lot of situations, it's not to say that those properties won't appreciate, but they would appreciate typically at a slower pace. And ultimately, when you look at, at the big picture long term, the higher growth, higher property class areas tend to just perform better overall. So that's a little bit more about, you know, kind of property classes. But again, this is going to de depend on, you know, are you looking for in income or long term wealth? And you know, do you have any plans to retire soon and your experience and all of these factors here on the screen. So these will all be important to, to get a better understanding before any kind of, I guess, firm determination is, is, uh, is chosen. Okay. <clears throat> so determining property class. So a key factor in understanding um, your property class is understanding your median home price. And the way we do that is it's based off of the, what we call an MSA, which is a metropolitan, metropolitan statistical area. Um, we obtain this information from the National Association of Realtors, and I can show you where that can be found. Um, but let's... Let's just say for easy numbers that the median home price for a particular area, again, an MSA is kind of a job that may be within a certain city and it's not perfectly within, you know, the whole city. It may kind of branch into just up certain parts of the city or expand it, you know, across outside of that city into another city. But the long and the short of it is, um, let for, for our example here, if we can assume that, you know, the median home price for a particular MSA is $100,000, right? So basically, 100% of that number is $100,000. So from $100,000 to $130,000 in that MSA, that would be considered an A-class property from 100 to 80 B, from 80 to 50 C. Anything north or higher than that 130 would be considered luxury. 
<clears throat> now that's how that's broken down. I'm going to show you a, a real properties or real, uh, you know, graphs that are going to represent, you know, uh, Texas and one in Tennessee, and it'll show you the actual median home prices in that area and how those property classes relate. Uh, the next scale below is 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 in reference to multifamily. So you know, as you buy multifamilies, your the prices go up, <clears throat> right? There's more doors, there's more rooms, there's more toilets, there's more things going on. So ultimately, as, as you can imagine, the price goes up. So the way that we factor in these property classes is we break down the per unit cost, right? So two hundred thousand dollar, you know let's call it $200,000 duplex, you would now say that uh, per unit, so $100,000. So basically, you know, this may be considered uh, a luxury class in that, you know, just easy, simple example that I just gave. So that's a little bit more about our property classes. Um, and <clears throat> as we were talking about our MSAs or metropolitan statistical areas, this is actually a um, a snippet of our ebook, which I which I will show you a little bit more um, in, in a second here. But um, basically, basically these snippets or these little these little homes on on the map represent MSAs. So this is again something that you can find in our ebook, and um, you know you can find it to the closest city to you, and and that's how we how we come to that conclusion, right? Or how we how we start at that number. And that's gonna be case by case, depending on the market you're looking in. So um, understanding a little bit more about property classes, right? Why are we putting so much focus into this? And I, and you know, ultimately there are certain things that we can focus on when we're analyzing a property and there's certain certain things that are not as easy to change um so like for example you know your luxury class properties you can see there's kind of just a quick breakdown maybe business owners are you going to find more in the luxury class a class or uh professional or kind of you know more white collar type of work whereas b class maybe um younger adults mid managers C class could be more considered hourly employees or, or blue collar type of work. And then D class, we would consider low income or below the poverty line. You know, and again, it's it's not to say that any of these are, are necessarily, um, again, like I said, we, we focus luxury to let's call it C, doesn't mean that good or bad. It's just, a it's, a, it's we wanna provide the information to set proper expectations, okay? So, the things that matter that that we like to focus on that also factor in into property classes is you know the price point that's a big factor as you as we covered right if you're going to look at the msa of an area the price point is going to have a big factor of where that that um designation that a b or c lands uh cost per square foot is going to be factored in but that's you know just a, a math equation school districts are important right there's a lot of folks that rent that have families that that want to focus on schools, crime rate as well, right? We want to make sure that crime rate is is lower. We're not, you know, encouraging folks to get into a dangerous area. Um, things that that matter <clears throat> not as much is, you know, the exact specifics. If it's uh, the type of property, right? A uh, house, condo, apartment, uh, the age of the property, property size, property condition. You know, a lot of these things are are you can change, right? An older property can be remodeled. A small property can be developed more, right? It, you can, it can be, uh, you know, there can be parts of the home that are built on. Um, property condition, again, it all kind of goes to like things can change. You can, you can improve a home significantly. It's much easier to improve a home than it is to try to renovate a neighborhood, right? Neighborhoods are going to be uh, much tougher to fix up and then that takes you know kind of a whole community to get behind so sometimes if you find a, a very inexpensive property and you think wow I can put all this money in, I'll make it the nicest one on the block well now you might have the nicest one on the block but the whole blocks in ruins the whole block has got has problems and that's what ultimately drives value in residential real estate our comps it's the surrounding properties next to you 
So if none of those are increasing value, if none of those owners are putting the effort that you've put forth to make your home nice, it's going to be hard because you're trying to set the high watermark. You're trying to be the, the one that, you know, my house is worth the most, but that's not what ultimately raises your value is all of the work you do. You know, that will work to a certain extent, but the real wealth is long-term hold by the whole community going up in value. So the way that we kind of, or the way I like to uh, make this easier to remember is uh, you'll see down below, A, B, and C class. A class properties equal appreciation, C class properties equal cash flow, and B class properties equal both. So I think that's kind of a, an easy way to remember and, and, you know, relatively speaking, pretty accurate in terms of, you know, expectations and, and what you can what you can expect by uh, just this, this property class designation. So next I want to talk to you guys a little bit about maintenance and vacancy. So <clears throat> for those of you that are have real estate or have owned real estate for a while or are more familiar with the with the whole concept, you understand that maintenance and vacancy are part of this process. It's not a matter of, you know, if it's a matter of when. You will have maintenance, you will have vacancy, right? Um, anybody who can tell you, you know, anyone who forecasts this and says, this is what your maintenance and vacancy will be with 100% certainty is not telling the truth. These are variable expenses. We don't know, right? No one can actually tell you at the end of 2023 those specific numbers now we can forecast them and we can forecast them based on past performances and kind of general expectations and, and another way we do that is based on property class again going back to the whole property class uh, conversation but um, ultimately you know you're going to see here that uh, a class properties tend to have a lower maintenance and vacancy and and it goes up in certain increments as you get to B and C class properties and down below you'll see that same kind of designation as it's broken out for you know larger multifamily but nonetheless this is what you'll see represented in in our uh, in our calculators when we're looking at a live example so technically if we had a B class property that I was going to show you we would be estimating 10% maintenance 10% vacancy Okay, so that's a little bit more of how the um, maintenance or yeah, how the maintenance is, is basically forecasted or how we handle that. The next we're going to show you a vacancy example. So vacancy is a, a little bit more challenging, right? Because it's uh, you, you don't it's not like a just based on a fixed amount but ultimately you know the way we do it is we take a you know 365 day year and we times it by this percentage and that will give you the days per year that we would say forecasted that it could be vacant and oftentimes this you know this vacancy is typically in between turns right so when a, when a, and what i mean by that is when a tenant moves out of a property and we have to fix it up or we call it a make ready right whether that's be whether that be paint or flooring or um just you know fixing of whatever kitchen bathrooms whatever we have to do to make it ready or sometimes it's in amazing shape and it's just a light clean and we're back on the market um but ultimately those are down days you're not collecting rent so we have to kind of forecast that and we just we like to definitely build in a little bit more you know so um, under promise and over deliver uh, is kind of the idea. So for an A-class property, basically at 8%, it would work out to about just under 30 days vacant, right? So that's kind of something that we forecast for people that are uh, that are looking into the A-class and it would increase as those property classes go up a bit or go down, I'm sorry. Um, in, in my experience, I, I have... <clears throat> I have a an, an A class property and in, in managed by Marshall Reddick, and <clears throat> it's definitely over the last three years been below this mark. But it's not to say that that can't go above it either, right? So, like I said, it's just a it's a forecast. It's something that rule of thumb that we'd like to use. Now, <clears throat> all of this that I just discussed is available 
and it's detailed in our ebook. So, you know, it really just breaks down the philosophy, um, sorry, the philosophy of how we rate properties and what those ratings translate to you as an owner. So this is free on our website. I'm happy to send it to anyone who, who wants to dive in. I, I wouldn't call it a, you know, a book as much as like a pamphlet. You know, it's not something that you're gonna spend a ton of time reading, but it is a good, you know, I, I find, you know, folks like you that are spending your time on a, on a webinar, like an hour long webinar for you to, you know, dive into this a little bit. I'm sure you would find a lot of value and some people learn better this way. So the links below, marshallreddick.com backslash ebook. Again, I'm happy to send it out to anybody who may be interested as well. So <clears throat> where to invest? As I mentioned earlier, um, we can agree that not every single market in the U.S. is a good place to invest. So, you know, where do we recommend that you, <clears throat> excuse me, where do we recommend that you invest? <clears throat> so we've put together some key criteria that we feel support a strong investment market. You're going to see all of these line items on our screen, right? Job market. <clears throat> I think that's really important. We want to make sure that the folks that are living or renting from us have jobs and have good jobs. So job market is important. Rental demand. You got to make sure that there is a, a demand for people. There's, there's, there is people, you know, population. We want to make sure that there's a, a demand for people to want to live there and jobs are kind of coincide with that economic diversity <clears throat> there is some areas in some markets where it's heavily or solely reliant on one industry or even sometimes one employer that's very dangerous and that's very risky for you as an investor because if something ever happens to that one sole kind of employment or you know, draw to that city, it could be trouble for that investment. So we want to make sure there's economic diversity there. Housing affordability is another big one. Um, we kind of touched on this earlier, kind of using the California example. Housing in California is is on the very high end of the, the country's kind of averages. So it's, it would be much more challenging to buy an investment property here than let's say in Tennessee right so housing affordability is important it helps you know allow people to get their foot in the door and allow the numbers to make sense for, for these properties strong education uh always important and then last but definitely not least reliable property management we want to make sure that you're in a market that has strong property management that has uh it's not just one you know mom and pop shop that kind of services this area you want to definitely have options and and people with experience especially if you're not going to be there right if you're going to be across the country working on you know your work and your family and other things you want to have somebody who's who's competent looking over what what will be you know one of the bigger or biggest investments of your life so <clears throat> a little bit about more about our markets. So we are um, <clears throat> spread across. We are we are we're spread across the whole country here, and you're going to see that there are um, highlighted green boxes here. These are markets in which Marshall Reddick has a physical footprint in. And what I mean by that is, you know, brick and mortar offices with property management. Uh, our brokerage, so our real estate agents, full service uh, type of element, right? So um, this is where we're doing the bulk of our business. You will see there are some uh, cities here that are not highlighted. It's a place that we've either in the past done a ton of business that we're typically helping folks do a lot more selling there, or we have very close, and, and the way we're doing that is by very close partnerships that we have with other firms or, or agents over the years. Um, so again, the, the bulk of the transactions or the bulk of the properties you're gonna find on our website, you're gonna find it with somewhere in these green boxes, but these are the markets that, you know, that we operate in for, for those of you that may be unfamiliar. So, um, 
why buy within a major metropolitan? So our, our guidance is <clears throat> we like to target major cities, major metropolitan cities, right? And the reason for that is larger tenant base. You wanna have a good population anywhere that you're gonna invest in. Again, they have diverse, you know, typically these larger metropolitans, they have a, a diversification of employers. Again, th this is all things that we just covered in terms of they'll have reliable property management. This ultimately gives those markets a, a path forward for a lot of growth. And the growth of the population, right, is going to definitely pave the way for appreciation. So, you know, as more and more people move, as more and more people buy, as those prices go up, you know, as time goes on, any of you that have owned homes for 5, 10, 15, some of you 20, 25 years, I don't have to explain what appreciation is to you guys. You've seen it firsthand. You know, you buy a house in the 90s for 200 or $300,000, and now it's, you know, in the millions, right? It's over a million dollars. You, you, you see that firsthand, and you can understand how that works uh, from a long-term standpoint. So now <clears throat> um, this is this I'm I I have an example here of you know within these metro major metropolitans we like to target the suburbs. Okay, so I've uh, I have an illustration here that shows you uh, some of some you know two major cities that we're operating in San Antonio, Texas, and Austin. And you'll see in the core, in the very downtown of those cities, it's actually we don't manage quite as much property in the in the dead center of those cities. And San Antonio is kind of unique because it's set up like a bullseye, right? So there's there's these rings, these freeway rings, and they kind of expand and they go outer. Uh, there's outer rings, and you'll see a lot of our properties are are kind of on the outskirts. And just to give you guys a point of reference, we're we're approaching you know just under 3,000 properties under management, you know, nationwide. But you'll see here too in Austin, the, the heart or the dead center of Austin is, is not as populated with our management as it is kind of on the outskirts. And I'm going to explain a little bit more as to why that is, right? So why would we not focus on the downtowns? Why would we focus more on the suburbs? Well, the suburbs are more likely to attract families. Those are the folks that <clears throat> typically stay longer, uh, oftentimes take really good care of the properties. There's better schools there. There's lower crime rates, right? There's they're newer properties. A lot of times, out you know, the center of any major metropolitan is older. That's where you know the the, the city started. So as you can imagine, everything is a bit older there. And as you, uh, what happens if more people are moving to this place? They're not going to just typically build you know, vertical, right, in the heart of the city, although that happens, but a lot of times there are, um, you know, new developments, newer developments, newer developments, and those go further and further out, right? So you're seeing a lot more newer properties as you get a little further out, and, and ultimately that does help push that path of growth. So that is the reasons why we target the suburbs of major metropolitans as opposed to, you know, kind of the older downtowns um, that may have a little bit more crime, older properties, and just a little bit more um, more to deal with, I would say. Uh, for those of you that are looking for <clears throat> more specific data or more demographic or, or metrics that you would you know kind of want to dive into to, to examine markets, I'm happy to either have those conversations with you guys, but also we have data packets here. We, we put these together annually and it just gives you kind of, like I said, more demographic information about each market to help, you know, for you to better understand high level populations, population growth, employers, kind of what's the main attractions of these markets. Um, and ultimately, you know, that'll help some of you folks get a better uh, direction of, of where you may want to focus. So these are also free on our website. Um, you'll, you'll have the link here. Again, I'm happy to send these to you if, if you wanted to uh, dive into these a little bit more. So next, we're going to talk a little bit about how to buy an investment property. And what I mean by how is like financing, right? Which method is, is the best for you? So 
Um, <clears throat> as you know, there is that uh, far and above the most popular or the most common method is conventional financing. So I came from a world of conventional financing. I did loans for over four years. And conventional financing is, is definitely the, the most common method of doing this. But let's say, for example, that you don't, um, you don't qualify or you, you know, you, you don't, because of the rates, you, you have another option. So there's always cash. If you have cash, you can buy, you can buy uh, all cash and no financing needed, right? A little bit, a little bit more pricey, right? Or it's going to have a much bigger impact on your bank account, I should say, but ultimately you can buy cash. Um, there's the ability to tap into equity in your existing real estate, whether it's a primary or an investment via a HELOC or a home equity line of credit, or another avenue is a cash out refinance. They, they work in similar, uh, they're a bit different, but they do work it with the same end result, which is you would be have cash or equity from existing real estate that you can then buy new real estate with. Um, I touched on this earlier, but Marshall Reddick does provide private financing. Uh, so, you know, we have a certain set of limited guidelines that we use that, you know, we can fund a, a project for you. 1031 exchanges is a huge one that we've been doing a lot of, especially recently. So uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with a 1031 exchange, that is um, when you, if you were just to sell, you would pay capital gains as well as some other you know, items that are involved, expenses or taxes involved. Um, but there is a way to defer those taxes. There is a way to uh, defer those by buying another property. Now there's, there's some specifics that go into exactly how a 1031 exchange is accomplished, but the, the nuts and bolts of it is you can sell a property, take all that money, buy a new property and not pay the capital gains tax. And you can keep doing that time and time again, right? So that's a, another common way that investors are kind of growing their portfolio, right? People always ask me, how do I grow my portfolio or how do I level up? And oftentimes it's through a 1031. It's by buying bigger, better, more, you know, higher functioning properties. And then uh, we have self-directed retirement accounts as well that, you know, individuals that that have capital in those, if you want to buy within, you know, tap into some of that money. So um, really quick, <clears throat> because conventional is kind of the, I would say the, the main avenue, I just want to go over really quick for those of you that are uh, a little less familiar with kind of the, the some of the requirements. Now, the, the challenge with, <clears throat> the challenge with conventional financing is, Oftentimes there is a lot of guidelines. There is a lot of uh, specifics that a lender is going to want to know and, and to, to even answer simple questions like what are the rates, right? That question could go a million different ways. How much are you putting down? What kind of property? What's your FICO score? You know, um, how many properties do you have? There's all kinds of things that go into that. But for you guys that are on this webinar tonight, I just wanted to cover very high level in terms of some down payments. I think that's an important question because some of you may... Um, have seen like, well, I can put, you know, 3% down or I can put 5% down or whatever that you may have seen or read the, the, the reality is for, for investment, for investment properties, <clears throat> the lowest down payment technically, at least for a one unit is 15% down. I have not seen one of those go through in years and years uh, because, and even right now I would say probably non-existent or the rate is so uh, off-putting that no one would go that route. So honestly, the, the more common for a single story, or I'm sorry, not a single story, but a single family. So a one unit is going to be 20 to 25% down. Okay. On our website, you are going to see for a single family home, the, the, the default down payment is 25. We do that because it helps lower the interest rate a little bit. It also helps lower the loan amount and improves some of the figures. So just know that there is a little bit of a, there's a gap there. There's a 5% kind of variance that you can play with if you're maybe more strapped for cash or, or want to keep more cash on hand, that you can bump that leverage up a bit. For multifamily, um, so for two to four units, 
it's a 25% down minimum. There's not a uh, there's 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 not another another route for that. Now uh, on our website though, again, kind of similar to the single uh, single family, we uh, the default down payment is 30%. So again, remember that that can come down a bit if if you're thinking about you know trying to keep a little more capital on hand. So. That's a little bit more about the down payments. That's kind of the biggest question when it comes to financing. We have an amazing preferred lender. Here's a little bit more about him. Reed Hazard at CMG Financial. He's been working with us for over 17 years. Um, he's licensed in all of the markets that we operate in. I've worked with him on countless transactions. I've worked with him personally on, on purchases that I've done. And uh, him and his team are awesome. I highly recommend uh, using him and I, I'm happy to <clears throat> make those intros because ultimately, you know, we can draw up a beautiful plan and a beautiful idea of what we want to do, but we are going to have to work within the parameters of financing. That is typically going to be the, the general path for, for us is we're going to have to work within the parameters given and Reed gives us those parameters, right? How much money do you have to invest your income your expenses your credit score what rate he gives us a lot of material to work with so when we go out we know what price points to look at we know what how these properties are going to perform based on that interest rate and what to expect so there's so much that that so much light and so much clarity that's given once you're pre-approved it doesn't cost you any money it doesn't it, it doesn't create you know any time of uh, like you have to buy, you can get pre-approved and not do another thing. It's 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 just more information and, and knowledge and tools that we can use to to get better options for you. So Reed's contacts here, a little bit more about them. Happy to make an intro if uh, if any of you are interested. Um, so now as we're uh, you know coming towards the end of this presentation, I just wanted to kind of go over um, kind of how does you know, how do you math mathematically measure the success of an investment, right? So, um, you know, it's all about the numbers, right? So there is, there is, there is kind of two sides to this. There's going to be um, cash flow and appreciation. So your cash flow is going to be measured by your cash on cash return. And your appreciation is typically going to be more measured by your return on investment. And we'll we'll look at we'll look at those uh, some examples of that in 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 a minute here, um, but you know as you as your as you get a higher cash flow you tend to have a little bit lower appreciation and, and vice versa. This was this was kind of something that we talked about uh, in in relation to the property classes. So um, our calculators that you're going to see on our website that are connected with every property. Um, are very detailed, right? And it basically covers any investment benchmark you would you would want to or you would need to analyze a property. Most of the fields too are editable. So if you disagree with something or you want to see what if uh, you know I got insurance for this much or what if my interest rate was this or what if we paid you know X for the property, all of our uh, the calculate it's like an Excel, right? So all of the calculations will adjust to to those edits that you made. So it's really cool. Uh, it's easy to work work on. Um, again, all of our pro formas are going to be 25% uh, down for a single family and 30% down for multifamily. And just remember, if you want to adjust those down a little bit, it is doable from a loan standpoint. Although I do kind of I do agree with the way we have them set up is probably the the best for um, getting a good return. Okay, quickly, I just wanted to kind of highlight our, our San Antonio market, right? So this is a market we do tons and tons of businesses, uh, business in. And, you know, one of the things I like to point out here is the 25 year appreciation trend. So you'll see kind of year over year from 1998 all the way to 2022, year over year. Um, besides the last two years, you're not gonna see any really a double digit increase or double digit decrease. And that's really exciting to me because it just shows stability. It shows a continued path up, right? Even through 2008, right? Which arguably is the, one of the worst real estate crises of ever. Uh, it performed well, it stayed solid through that. 
So that's a really good, you know, that to me, that's a great market that you may want to invest in, especially from a long-term standpoint. Um, and then down below there, you'll see our, our uh, property classes. So in our example, we used 100,000. Well, in this example, the median home price, you know, for example, in San Antonio is 337,700. So from 337 to 439 is considered A class. And you can see the associated ranges there. And that's, that's what you'll see on our website. So that's kind of gives you a more real life example or in a real market. <clears throat> I also <clears throat> wanted to um, bring a property. Uh, you know, this is one of our new construction duplexes in Texas. This is, a, a again, a duplex. So this is a two unit. Um, these have been an amazing amazing resource or should I say a product for a lot of our investors uh, it kind of hits a lot of very popular metrics which are new construction and multifamily that's a, a very popular combination the the popular the, the popularity for new construction is everything is new everything has a sticker on it everything should be working perfectly and have a very long life so that's going to really bring down your your maintenance right? You're, anything's breaking down. It's going to really bring that down and it's going to allow you to hold on to something of quality for a long period of time without having to put very much money into it. And then the duplex is, is interesting because it helps, you know, instead of one door, you have two doors. Instead of the, relying on one tenant, you, you can spread it amongst two, two tenants. And, you know, one thing that I really liked about, uh, I have a multifamily, I have a duplex in Texas myself. And one thing I really liked is you know, smaller or incremental rent increases, you know, per one unit, you get to times that by two. So if it's 50 or 100 bucks, you, you just raise rent 100 to 200 dollars by, and it's not going to get someone to 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 move out, right? You don't have to you don't have to kind of twist the screws on on one person. You can slowly do that, and when you have multiple doors, it really helps your bottom line, which is nice. Um, but really quick here, these these properties. Uh, list price is 545. Again, you'll see the breakdown here. Uh, this is a PDF version, so it's not like editable here, and it's a different format on the website. But this is going to give you the same nuts and bolts. 30% um, down is what we forecasted. Again, you can do 25. We have an estimated closing cost here, right? Which is typically uh, the way that the calculator factors that in is is an amount based on on the purchase price. Again, these can vary a little bit. So ultimately, investment capital needed is just under 175. <clears throat> so gross rent is 3,700. So that's uh, for both doors, right? So um, we all, now the the next line item here is kind of the biggest line item in the sense of or the most uh, I guess challenge that we've faced recently, which is interest rates. So interest rates, as you know, or uh, may not or have heard about have been on the increase, right? So that's eaten into cash flow quite a bit and it's made properties much more difficult to cash flow. So those that are, are solely looking for cash flow, it is, it is much more of a challenge and uh, maybe not the, 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 the only answer, you know, to, to fix that is real estate because you have to really, real estate is definitely more of an all-encompassing factor. And I think there's more, much more that goes into real estate than just cash flow. There's appreciation. There's your ability to, you know, expense, use, use as a, a huge cost savings when it comes to taxes via depreciation and writing things off and lowering your income. So, uh, but nonetheless, um, you know, REIT is definitely able to provide some of the most competitive rates I've seen. Um, this for this is for a forecasted 30-year fix. Now, there's multiple ways. 30-year fix is kind of the bread and butter of, of of loans, right? It's what most folks have. But in environments like this, when the real estate market is changing, when the loan world is changing, you do have to get more creative. You do have to be more open to other alternatives. And I can tell you uh, what's coming back and what's really showing up great benefit to some of these investments are adjustable rate mortgages better known as arms and we have a lot that are in that that the for example they're fixed for a certain period of time three five seven and ten are kind of the standard terms 
<clears throat> a 10 one arm means that it's fixed for 10 years and then starting year 11 it will go adjustable the rates significantly improve when you're willing to consider one of those and the the basically the hedge is that within 10 years you're going to be able to essentially find a 30-year fix that is going to be better than 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 what you get for that 10 one arm and we've seen you know 10 one arms below five percent right you may have to pay a point or two or uh, leverage some you know credit from the seller to help buy your rate down but those are the toxic tactics and things we're using to really improve the interest uh the the numbers i didn't do any of that for this particular property so i just kind of wanted to show you more of the flow of of how it works as opposed to every um you know i guess tactic that we're using at this time but you know after your interest rate you're going to see taxes that are taken out you're going to see insurance the management fee we're going to factor in assuming that you're going to be using us for management this is a multifamily, so the management fee is seven percent of the monthly rent this property has an hoa some do some don't we wanted to factor that in and utilities and landscaping that you know most of the time our tenants are, are covering the all of their utilities and their landscaping so you won't oftentimes see see numbers in those categories but basically all of your fixed expenses come out <clears throat> come out to 3419 so 3700 minus 3419 is going to give you a monthly income of 280 which is great you are cash flowing there now down below you will see there are the maintenance and vacancy assumptions now keep in mind because this is an A-class property, <clears throat> our rule says 8% maintenance, 8% vacancy. Now, because it's new construction, we do have a slight um, kind of variance to that rule. And we bumped that down to 5% as everything is brand new. The likelihood of even at 5% is probably high, but we do want to factor something in, right? So having 5% maintenance and 8% vacancy, when you subtract that, you do see the estimated, and then there's a leasing fee. So I'll explain that a little bit later, but that's the, the cost to procure tenants, to place tenants in the property. But ultimately, you know, when you factor that in, it would show a negative 300. Now, I don't want you to think like you're gonna owe $300 every month. That's not actually how it works. What we're saying is that if all of those were to come to fruition in that year, that would be a negative year. And this is year one. You have to remember that your year one is gonna typically be your toughest year. You're usually gonna have the highest interest rate. You're usually gonna have the lowest rents, right? You're usually gonna have, it's just getting started, right? There may be some, not for this new construction, but there may be some, Kind of capital expenditures that you have to pay for to to get the property up and running up to par so the 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 thing that is not factored into these calculations is rental increases which are very very common i've raised rents multiple times in in my time owning properties and i think those of you who own property would would agree to that and the nice thing is a lot of your fixed expenses uh, well, at least from a from a mortgage standpoint, they stay the same for quite some time, right? I know in the 10 one arm example, in 10 years it will change, but for those of you that have a 30 year fix, it, it will stay the same throughout. So um, that's really important, and, and it's a good thing to note um, that with time these numbers change. For example, my duplex that I purchased in Texas, right? The first year at acquisition, I was barely breaking even. It was after fixed expenses, so literally it cost me this almost the same amount after rent and all my expenses i had zero dollars but upon acquisition i was able to raise the rents you know 150 each because they were behind and then just like that now i'm up 300 right and from a fixed standpoint not including maintenance and vacancy but just like that it can change relatively quickly so something to consider um and then down below you'll see your <clears throat> year 15 projected profit so our our calculators project or have a default hold time of 15 years you can change that you can change that to one year you can change that to 50 years whatever you want but our default is 15 years it's you know what we feel like is a pretty common or or what we would say is long-term hold and that's you know you would be able to see quite a bit of 
success given a you know given an investment property that much time and basically your profit which is going to be you know um all of your cash flow all of your appreciation all of your principal pay down so every time that you know you make a mortgage payment you have to pay interest but also a little bit of the principal goes down so that's factored in you're going to owe less now when you when you sell so we factor in principal pay down and then we back out your selling expenses so what it would cost to sell that's how we arrive at that profit number, right? Return on investment, 17%. How is that done? That's essentially taking a 15 years, you know, of profit and dividing that by what it costs you to invest, what you know, the capital investment needed, right? So that's how you're um, you're getting to that return on investment, and that's going to change based on the amount of time held. So as you hold less, that number is going to go down quite a bit, right? Uh, and as you go longer, that number can go up. But there is kind of a, a I would say, it doesn't, it, it doesn't increase the same amount every year. There's, there's years, you know, uh, and, and this sweet spot of, of 15 years is, is a good, a good range for us. Now, I won't spend as much time on the, on the next few, um, but because <clears throat> I know we're, uh, we're going a little bit over time here. But I did want to just kind of spend some time on that one to break down the calculators. Um, here's another example of the Clarksville market. <clears throat> Clarksville, Tennessee, awesome market that we operate in. A little bit lower of a price point, right? So the median home price there is 247. You can kind of see the ranges associated there. Same kind of theme though. Um, year over year shows really solid appreciation, a bit slower or a bit lower than Texas. But one thing about Tennessee that's um, really incredible is that um, you know, the property taxes there are so low. So it really, you know, sometimes you're going to see properties that have really good cash flow. And that's because <clears throat> a lot of the fixed expenses are a bit lower there. So that's really nice to see. Um, again, though, it, you know, for example, Texas, property taxes are a bit higher. The, the nice thing about um, investment real estate is you can write all of this off. Taxes, property taxes, interest, expenses, property management fees, all of the, the costs associated, and, and then depreciation, which is a paper loss. And in some cases, um, that is why people buy investment properties to show these losses, to record these paper losses, to help them offset some of the, the money they owe in, in taxes. Again, not a tax professional, so you would you would want to consult your CPA for, for any of this guidance, but that is definitely a, um, a theme that we see. So here's another quick breakdown of a property here. <clears throat> This is a, a property in Clarksville, single single family built in 2016, three bed, two bath, um, $320,000 purchase price. We're assuming a 30% down payment. Now, this is not typical. This is normally 25. I think just the way that the property was set up was at 30, uh, probably for a specific investor. Um, initial repair cost. This is a forecasted number. This is just to say, hey, we might have to get in and do some paint or some carpet or whatever that may be, that number could be zero, that number could be higher. It's just, we're gonna know more about that number after a home inspection. But ultimately, closing costs are factored in and then the investment capital needed. Again, you take your gross rent, you minus your mortgage, taxes, insurance, management fee. This is 8%, so 8% is a basically our, our management fee for single, single families. Um, so you'll notice that the management fees will go down as the number of un units you have, just kind of economies of scale. And uh, there's no HOA here, no you know utilities or landscaping. So the numbers for this one is 1,900 minus the 1,718. You get 181. And then again, you get into a situation where 8% maintenance, 8% vacancy, plus your leasing fee minus 175. Again, this is year one. This could easily change very quickly, right? And I think that's that's the picture where that's the that is what ultimately we're trying to explain. This isn't a get rich quick type of investment. This isn't something that overnight you buy one investment property and you can go to your boss and say, I'm rich, I'm I'm out of here, I'm never coming back. Right. This is a long-term strategy, right? And over time, I can't tell you, you know, how many people that you may know personally, or if you've spoken to anybody with, with wealth or that has some kind of passive income, I, I can almost guarantee that real estate is, is part of that in some capacity. So 
you got to start you got to start somewhere and i think single families or just a uh, single investment property is a great way to get going and, and learn a ton so <clears throat> Here's the projected profit, 145, 295, and then your your you know basically annual average return on investment would be nine percent, assuming a 15 year hold, right? So there's a little bit more about um, about this Clarksville property. As we're gonna as we are closing here, I just wanted to go over really quick about property management. Um, you'll see it's between you know eight and seven percent is what a lot of uh, our property management monthly fee is going to be the only other or the other the main other fee we charge is our leasing fee that's what what we charge to place a tenant so from a vacant property to market the tenant uh, market the property to do the showings to do the background checks to place the tenant we take 50 percent five zero of the first month's lease we only take that when we're placing tenants if a tenant stays for four years you've only paid one leasing fee for four years so it's only when it goes vacant. Um, property management, what do they actually do, right? So here's kind of some bullet points here, but ultimately, you know, we need we need to know the rental laws. Rental laws are different in each in each state, in each market. And it's really important for you as a landlord to know those. And we do that on your behalf to make sure we keep you out of trouble, right? We send the proper disclosures. Ultimately, our goal, keep you out of court. We don't want to do things incorrectly where a tenant can then say hey i'm you know you did this wrong and you owe me money or whatever the case may be that's that's the key element to property management and it puts a barrier between you and the tenant right which is so important you have probably a million other things to worry about and and not you know following specific codes and rules up to the law is probably last on your on your list so it just puts a person responsible entity in between you and the tenant um, of course, with any investment, there's going to be risk. That's that's the nature of an investment. But you know, ultimately, <clears throat> I think real estate is a tried and true method. And the you know the best way to reduce your risk uh, is you know buying in good areas. We spoke about the different property classes earlier, and it's so important. You know, buying in quality areas, buying in a market right that has uh, good employment. It's it's important in terms of when you're looking at a property a home inspection is so important it's a great negotiation tool and it, it has great info for you and for the property management team so we know if there are problems and almost every single home has some kind of problem at least we know what we're up against so those are so important natural disasters right some of you may fear you know i hear about hurricanes and tornadoes and this and there's there are things that happen there are natural disasters and good insurance is really important. We and we also encourage about you know liability, 500k in liability for to, to cover any kind of tenant problems that may arise. Um, but ultimately, the best way to reduce your exposure is good property management and solid insurance policy. So, for those of you that are interested in learning just more, um, Marshall Reddick is a one-stop shop. It starts with myself as the advisor, and I loop you in with the following folks here that you see on the screen. We're all about education, you know, webinars like this. We have events, uh, in-person events. We have articles that we've written, um, tons and tons of stuff that you guys can can all use and, and, and get for free. We're really excited to share this information. We hope that we can provide enough value to you guys that you see us as being a good partner or a good resource for you to, to either start your real estate portfolio or, or expand your real estate portfolio. So, um, for any of you that guys that may be interested in having more of a conversation, I'd be I'd be super excited to get on the phone with you, learn a little bit more. It doesn't mean that you have to buy property tomorrow or this week or even this year. If it's something that is on the forefront and you want to set up a plan or <clears throat> get some ideas of how to how to get the ball rolling, I'm happy to do that as well. So uh, I'm going to be doing some follow up calls this week, so you can expect a call from me. Uh, these calls can be as long or as short as you want. Um, I'm here to basically answer questions and help guide you through however, you know, what whatever is on top of your mind. So here's my contact information below. Uh, I want to thank you guys all so much for, for taking the time to be on the webinar this evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to be able to, to connect with all you folks, and um, I look forward to chatting soon. So thank you so much. Have a great night.